Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to call this January 20th, 2021 meeting of the Hampton School Board to order. Ms. Bowers, would you please call the roll? Ms. LaFonja? Here. Ms. Banks Gray? Present. Ms. Cherry? Here. Dr. Mason? Here. Mr. Samuels? Present. Dr. Woodhouse? Here. Mr. Kilgore. Here. Let the record show that all board members are present this evening. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda for this evening? So moved. Second. I have, I have a motion from Ms. Cherry and a second from Ms. Banks Gray. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote? Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Ms. Cherry? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Afonja? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, our next section of the meeting is recognitions, and this evening, our Executive Director of Public Relations and Marketing, Ms. Gore, will be leading that with support from school board member, Ms. Cherry. Ms. Gore? Thank you, uh, Chair Kilgore. All right. Well, again, thank you, Chair Kilgore, Vice Chair Woodhouse, members of the school board and members of the Hampton City Schools family. Tonight, we have one recognition to celebrate. It is my pleasure to bring to the board the Virginia Department of Education's 2020 Mary Peak Award for Excellence in Education Equity. The Commonwealth is committed to ensuring that its public education system is positioned to achieve equitable academic outcomes for all students. And as such, the Mary Peak Award for Excellence in Education Equity highlights individuals and organizations that have made significant contributions to the advancement of equity in education for students in Virginia. The award offers the Commonwealth an opportunity to recognize individuals in four categories, one being educators, policymakers, also school leaders, and educational advocacy groups or stakeholder organizations whose service and leadership is impacting equity outcomes for Virginia students. So during a virtual recognition ceremony that was held on Thursday, December the 3rd, our governor, first lady, our secretary of education, and state superintendent announced the winners. So I'm honored. To share that our superintendent, Dr. Jeffrey Smith was selected as the recipient of the 2020 Mary Peak Award for Excellence in Education Equity in the school leader category. Mary Peak's passion for education, especially in marginalized communities and the belief that education has a profound impact on students families and the community is deeply rooted literally, literally and figuratively in the culture of Hampton. And Dr. Smith shows the same level of determination in advancing equitable educational opportunities and in ensuring equitable outcomes for all students, regardless of their race, income, or background. He is focused on transforming teaching and learning in Hampton City Schools and implementing innovative strategies around closing the achievement, opportunity, and equity gaps that exist among marginalized student groups. And by cultivating, cultivating internal and external alliances, Dr. Smith continues to ensure HCS provides personalized learning experiences offered in cutting edge learning environments. His commitment to advancing education equity has resulted in every Hampton student being connected with college and career pathway opportunities in our community through every level of their educational track. And so at this time, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Ms. Cherry to share a few words. Thank you, Ms. Gore. First of all, I think it goes without saying that everybody, not only in Hampton City Schools, but members of the board and the community as well, all recognize how blessed we are to have someone like Jeffrey Smith being our superintendent of schools. But when you hear it from someone outside of the community, it really is impactful. Therefore, I would like to start this by sharing a statement from a letter Dr. Smith received from the Virginia Superintendent of Public Ed Instruction, um, Public Education, Dr. James Lane. And this is what Dr. Lane said, and I quote, 
Your contribution is a continuation of the legacy Mary Peak began, a true testament to the ongoing journey towards education equity and inspiration to us all. As a commonwealth, we are committed to ensuring that our public education system is positioned to achieve equitable academic outcomes for all students, a value Mary Peak held so deeply. We rely on equity champions like you, and he's talking about Dr. Smith, like you, who work tirelessly each day to ensure that we reach this goal. I cannot thank you enough for your contributions and commitment to this work. Your support of Virginia students is truly invaluable, end quote. You know, Dr. Lane is absolutely correct. He talks about the fact that every time you hear the word Mary Peak, you hear the word equitable education as well. And those are the same words that guide Superintendent Dr. Jeffrey Smith. So on behalf of the entire member, members of the school board, every one of us, and our community that, again, is so blessed to have you as our leader, our CEO, when it comes to public education, we want to say thank you. We want to say congratulations. And we want to let you know that you have shown a level of determination in advancing equitable and educational opportunities and ensuring equitable outcomes, just as Mary Peak did for all of our students. You know, you are focused, Dr. Smith, on transforming teaching and learning in Hampton City Schools. You've said that from the beginning. And you also have been transformed and fixated, actually, on implementing innovative strategy, strategies to that end. You've dealt with the equity gaps, about closing achievement gaps, by cultivating internal and external alliances within the community and outside the community. Dr. Smith continues, continues to ensure Hampton City Schools provides personalized learning experiences offered in cutting edge learning environments. His commitment to advancing education is unbelievable. So Dr. Smith, again, while I am regurgitating the very words that Ms. Goral said, I think it's important because this board and this community is really, really proud that through your vision of advancing education equity, not only the academies of Hampton, but also our systems approach, we are truly on a clear path for graduations and a smooth transition for our students from high schools to post-secondary college or career field or the world of work. The board knows, Dr. Jeffrey Smith, that you firmly believe in this school division's mission of ensuring academic excellence for every child, every day, whatever it takes. So that's a long congratulations, but you deserve every bit of it. And thank you. So let's all give Dr. Smith, our superintendent of schools, a very big applause. Thank you, school board uh, member, Ms. Cherry, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, let me first begin by stating that as a school division, this is an honor for all of us. Um, as I expect, as I really expressed uh, during our city council meeting, um, I accept this award really on behalf of our students, families, the Hampton City School Board, members of the division leadership team, administrators, teachers, support staff, and our entire community. Let me say that to be recognized for any accomplishment that is laced and associated with Mary Peak is nothing short of being absolutely amazing and humbling. Um, as I said during the uh, ceremony hosted by the Virginia Department of Education, it is humbling because as you mentioned, Ms. Cherry, Ms. Peak's legacy 
it was that of impact for all students. Uh, she set a goal for all of us. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve here in the city of Hampton and to call Hampton home. I'm grateful for the opportunity to work um, as superintendent uh, with this amazing school board. Thank you for your leadership as a governing body. Let me also say that uh, the fact that uh, Mrs. Uh, Mary Peake's life's mission uh, is deeply rooted here in Hampton, Virginia, makes this recognition even more so special for us and for me, especially given um, our mission as a school division, and that is academic excellence for every child, every day, whatever it takes. I'm grateful for that. And so ladies and gentlemen, today, once again, I am reminded like our Vice President Kamala Harris, we all stand on the shoulders of other trailblazers and giants who came before us. So then, together, I know that we will continue to build toward a better tomorrow for the next generation Thank you so very much, Ms. Cherry, for your kind words on behalf of the board. And thank you to the Hampton community for allowing me to serve and this board in particular and the staff for your exceptional leadership. You can lead, but as Ms. Cherry would say, you better make certain that you have individuals who are willing to follow and who believe in the mission and the vision and in Hampton City Schools we have such. Thank you so very much. Again, it's a humbling experience and it's with much gratitude that um, I pause to say thank you. And Mr. Uh, Chair Kilgore, that concludes our recognition for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goral and Ms. Cherry for supporting and again, congratulations, Dr. Smith. And again, thank you for all you do. Okay, at this time, we will move on to uh, section three of our agenda, which is the consent agenda, which consists of personnel report number 21-01 and item 3.02, minutes of the school board meeting of December 16th, 2020. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Mr. Chair, I make the motion that we approve the set agenda as it has been presented. Second. I have a motion from Dr. Woodhouse and a second from Mr. Samuels. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote? Ms. Cherry. Aye. Dr. Mason. Aye. Mr. Samuels. Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Safanja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. The motion carries. Our next section of the meeting is the superintendent and staff reports, and I will turn it over to Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. It is my pleasure um, at this time to ask um, Ms. Dort, our chief financial officer, uh, to take the lead as it relates to the FY 2020-2021 uh, budget update, and she'll also speak to specific uh, recommendations within this particular report. So, Ms. Dorsch, please. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Good evening, Chair Kilgore, Vice Chair Woodhouse, school board members, Dr. Smith, and the Hampton community. It is my pleasure tonight to provide an update to the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget and also recommendations. So within this presentation tonight, I'm gonna to discuss our current state budget and then discuss the governor's proposed budget for this year, the December reforecast, and then end with recommendations to the school board. 
So back in March of 2020, the school board approved the fiscal year 2021 budget and it included state funds of $146 million. Within this budget, new initiatives were approved such as compensation increases, market adjustments, and additional positions. However, due to the spread of COVID-19 and what has now been a 10 month pandemic thus far, the General Assembly had to make adjustments to the state budget based on how the pandemic could potentially impact state revenues. And also furthermore, how enrollment and state sales tax could be impacted. The General Assembly um, through the Virginia Department of Education, um, they advise all school divisions to make adjustments to their budget. So therefore in May of 2020, the school board approved adjustments to temporarily suspend some new initiatives until we received a better revenue forecast. Additionally, we also created, and it was approved to have an additional contingency in place to protect the division against enrollment losses and also any additional state sales tax losses over and above what the General Assembly was initially projecting. Because the majority of those initiatives were temporarily suspended, um, the budget was not requested by city council to be reduced down to $136 million. However, internally within the school division, we put measures in place to make sure that we did not spend any of the funds that we were not sure of at the time would be received until the December reforecast was provided and communication and subsequent approval from the school board was given. So each year in December, the governor releases a reforecast of the current year budget. If it is the first year of a two-year state budget, then the governor produces a initial budget for the next two years. So since fiscal year 2021 is the first year of the two-year biennium, the governor did release last month a reforecast for the current school year. So within the governor's budget, it includes updates to the state funding formula based on revised membership projections. And for Hampton City Schools, our fiscal year 2021 average daily membership is projected to be 18,692. When compared to our original average daily membership projection of 19,030, this is 338 students lower. And just for some additional context, across the Commonwealth of Virginia, enrollment is down over 44,000 students. Because of this decrease in enrollment, included in the governor's budget is a no loss funding program. The purpose of this program is to preserve state funding to help school divisions who have experienced enrollment losses with the expectation that enrollment losses will reach the pre-pandemic numbers by 2023. The reforecast also includes updates to state sales tax and lottery revenue estimates, which have and continue to trend in a positive direction. And just for some context there, um, based on a recent December state revenue report, state general fund revenue collections are up 15.1% from the previous year. And also included in the governor's proposal is a COVID relief fund. And this is a one-time funding program to also help divisions. So what does this mean for Hampton City Schools? So based on the December reforecast, Hampton City Schools is projected to recoup $5.3 million of state funding, primarily as a result of the no loss funding program and the COVID-19 relief payments. In addition, the governor's proposal would allow us to release and repurpose our internal contingencies that we put in place 
for COVID-19 enrollment loss and state sales tax losses. In total, this would allow us to have an additional expenditures within fiscal year 2021 of $6.9 million. However, it is important to note that of this amount, $2.3 million is not expected to be reoccurring as those amounts relate to the no loss funding program and the one-time COVID-19 relief payments. Therefore, based on this information um, with the division leadership team and Dr. Smith, we looked at the amount of funding that we have available and we looked at what could we do to have the largest impact for the greatest number of employees while also making sure that we're maintaining our focus on our strategic plan and school board priorities, but also making sure that we're sustaining our funding as well. So based on the $6.9 million, tonight I am presenting recommendations for additional spending to the 2021 budget. And these recommendations are not in any order of um, priority. So I'm gonna start um, with the first recommendation to prepare for a potential change in the standards of quality as it relates to the pupil to school counselor ratio. Within the governor's budget, um, there is a proposal to lower the ratio to 325 students to one school counselor beginning next school year. If this is approved by general, the General Assembly, uh, we are recommending to the school board to get ahead of this change, if approved, to help us in preparing for next school year. The second recommendation is to add one-time pandemic support to our food and nutrition services budget for revenue loss due to the pandemic. Our employees and the Department of Food Services, they have been on the front line since this um, pandemic has began. And we are definitely appreciative of the dedication and the hard work that they continue to do as it relates to feeding our young people. Um, with our continued focus of feeding our young people, there still has been an impact to the financial operations because of the pandemic. And this is really because naturally, you know, in a virtual environment, there are often less students requesting meals. So this one-time support will help ensure that our food service department and budget maintains an adequate reserve. And a good benchmark is around three months of operating expenses. And this is gonna to help to make sure that as we go into next school year, that they have that adequate reserve in place to make sure that they can um, have funds available to address those normal routine issues that may come up from time to time such as equipment replacements that may be needed. The last three recommendations are focused around our priorities to attract and retain exceptional staff. The first recommendation is to restore um, a 2% compensation increase for employees effective February 1st, 2021. If approved, employees would see the impact of this compensation increase in their February 15th paycheck. Now with President's Day being on February 15th, the employees would actually receive their checks on February 12th, which is the Friday before. The second recommendation is to restore the minimum wage increase to $9.50. And the General Assembly passed legislation um, last year to require the minimum wage to be at $9.50 starting May 1st of 2021, but we are recommending the school board to begin um, this change earlier, effective February 1st. For those employees who would be impacted, we are recommending to the school board to provide the greater benefit of a 2% increase um, versus the minimum wage increase to $9.50. So there's about 80 to 90 um, staff members who would be impacted 
for this recommendation for minimum wage increase. So if a 2% compensation increase provided a greater benefit for an employee, then the 2% will be provided. But if a $9.50 hourly rate provided a greater benefit, then that would be the change for the employee. And then the last recommendation under attract and retain exceptional staff is to provide a one-time flat rate bonus for employees of $750 effective February 1st, 2021 to be paid on February 12th, 2021. So based on these recommendations, I wanted to just kind of recap what this means for compensation in fiscal year 2021. So if approved by the school board on February 1st, employees would receive a 2% compensation increase and teachers would also move up a step on the teacher scale. And again, this would begin with the February 15th paycheck, which will have to be paid on February 12th due to President's Day. So for example, if a teacher with a bachelor's degree had five years of completed service, they would currently be on step four earning $46,363. Effective February 1st, that teacher will be moved to step five on the teacher scale and will be earning $47,290. And if this 2% is approved, if we look back to fiscal year 16, 17, our teachers who have been on the teacher scale would have received 12% of an increase in their pay in the last five years. And again, on February 15th, to be paid out on the 12th, employees would receive a one-time flat rate bonus of $750 if approved by the school board. And this amount is the actual amount that employees would take home after taxes. So all of the recommendations tonight have been vetted again with the division leadership team and through the budget committee. And they have been based on, you know, making sure that we look at how we can have that largest impact on the greatest number of employees, by also making sure that we're continuing to push forward in our strategic plan but making sure that we do make sure that we can sustain all of these recommendations in the future years. This concludes the presentation of the fiscal year 2021 budget update. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dortch. Do I have any questions from board members? All right. Yes, Mr. Samuels. Uh, thank you, Chairman Kilgore, for the uh, opportunity to speak. I just want to um, um, let Ms. Uh, uh, um, Brittany know that this was a great presentation. I, um, I, as you were speaking, um, uh, Ms. Dorch, I reflected back on the um, two by two meetings um, we had with the superintendent as he, he's, as he was um, laying out this plan. And I felt it was such a great opportunity and um, plan for our um, staff. And as you know, there are many um, um, shortcuts and hiccups as it relates to the pandemic. Um, our, our staff has experienced a lot of uh, um, um, issues and so forth. And I firmly believe that this one time $750 will benefit our staff tremendously. Um, and, and, and that will be used to support rent, food and, and, and so forth. And, and just to also add that additional 2% that they receive, that they will receive um, this fiscal year. Um, that is tremendous. And um, as a board member, I, and I can just only say that this highlights the commitment that this board um, has um, uh, for our teachers and our staff. So I just wanna say great presentation and I 100% and I support this recommendation and also kudos to um, Dr. Smith and his staff for coming up with this great plan. Thank you, Mr. Samuels. Any other questions from Ms. Dorch? All right. I'll turn back over to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that uh, Ms. Dorch, she's up to bat again. And so I'm going to ask that she would continue with uh, fiscal year 
2021-2022 in terms of the uh, the budget forecast at this time. Uh, Ms. Dorch. Thank you. So good evening again. It is my pleasure to not only be able to present the 2021 update, but also to discuss the forecast for the 2022 school year. So within the presentation tonight, we'll look at the Hampton City Schools fund structure, discuss the budget development process and school board's priorities for next school year, look at the revenue sources for Hampton City Schools, discuss the two main drivers of state funding, and then we'll end with the governor's proposed budget expenditure pressures and next steps and key dates for the community. So within Hampton City Schools, we receive revenue from various sources and those revenues are used in five separate funds within the school division. The largest fund is the school operating fund or fund 50. And this is where the majority of our expenses to operate the school division are held teacher salaries and benefits, utility costs, transportation costs are some examples of the expenditures within Fund 50. Food and Nutrition Services Fund, Fund 51, comprises the revenue and expenses that are needed to operate our school meal program. Reimbursable Projects Fund, Fund 60, this fund mainly includes our federal grant programs such as Title I. The Rental Income Fund, Fund 65, accounts for all the rental activities within the division. For example, we have rental space um, for the Hampton Head Start program. And then last but not least, our Athletics Fund, Fund 94, accounts for the revenues and expenditures that support our sports programs within the school division. On an annual basis, the budget development team has to prepare a budget for each one of these funds. And the process that we utilize to do this happens in five phases. Um, first, starting with planning, then data collection, review and presentations, approvals, and finally close out. Since October, we have been in the data collection phase and this has included departments submitting budget requests through our financial system units, calculations for salaries and benefits, and budget meetings with individual departments. For the fiscal year 2022 process, members within finance met one-on-one -on -one with departments to provide a refresher training on how to submit electronic requests for their budgets and units. And different from last year's process, because of the pandemic, we initially shared with departments that no new funding requests should be entered into MUNIS because we really needed to continue to keep our focus on those initiatives that were suspended at the forefront of our budget planning for next school year. Back in November, the school board provided feedback on your priorities for next school year. The results are presented on this slide and are based on the most common responses received from multiple members of the school board. Under Maximize Every Child's Learning, we have the Academies of Hampton, Student Achievement, and Reducing Class Sizes. Under attract, develop, and retain exceptional staff, we have competitive compensation and teacher retention. And under create safe and nurturing schools, we have facilities and capital improvements and ongoing emphasis on school safety measures. The resources that are available to support the school board priorities and the strategic plan come from five different sources. And you'll see in this graph that the majority of our revenue with 55% comes from state revenue and state sales tax. And this will primarily be the focus for the remainder of the presentation. The two main drivers for state revenue are the local composite index and average daily membership. 
the local composite index or LCI. This is a measure that is used by the state to determine a locality's ability to pay for education costs under the standards of quality. The LCI, it is calculated every two years and it's based on the true value of real property, adjusted gross income and taxable retail sales. For fiscal year 2022, the local composite index for Hampton City Schools is 0 0.2743 or 27.43%. Average daily membership or ADM, this is the number of days of membership of all students during a period of time, which is also known as the total aggregate daily membership, divided by the number of days in session between the first day of school and the last day of school in March, which is typically around March 31st. For fiscal year 2022, the projected average daily membership is 18,813. When compared to the revised fiscal year 2021 average daily membership, this would be an increase of 121 students. However, this is still 217 students below our pre-pandemic average daily membership projection of 19,030. And on a statewide basis, fiscal year 2022 ADM projections are over 44,000 dollars excuse me, 44,000 students lower than the pre-pandemic estimates. One of the major events of the data collection phase is the release of the governor's budget. And the majority of our state funds are received, that are received, they actually go into our school operating fund or fund 50. So as part of the 22 amended budget that was released by the governor last month. It included updates to state funding formula for the revised membership projections, updates to sales tax and lottery revenue estimates for fiscal year 2022. It included a proposed 2% bonus for standards of quality funded instructional and support positions effective July 1, 2021. There was restoration of state funding for Virginia preschool initiatives or the VPI program and then other early childhood programs. Also the addition of the proposal to lower the school counselor ratio to 325 to one. And it included the continuation of the no loss funding. And remember this um, new program is directly related to the state trying to preserve state funding for enrollment loss and is not expected to continue beyond fiscal year 2022 based on what we know currently. So what does this mean for Hampton City Schools? So based on the governor's budget, we would be projected to receive an additional $3.5 million of state funding. And that additional state funding is in comparison to the governor's proposed 2021 state budget for Hampton City Schools that was presented earlier. This $3.5 million comes from $1.5 million to support the 2% bonus, $1.3 million um, based on how the projected increase in enrollment will impact standards of quality programs such as basic aid and state funding to support the lower counselor to pupil or pupil to counsel counselor ratio. And then also a $700,000 net increase in other programs. And that net increase is primarily made of $3 million for increases in the Virginia preschool initiative program and for at risk funding but also that decrease that I spoke of earlier, $2.3 million in that no loss funding program and that removal of COVID-19 relief payments that is only proposed for fiscal year 2021. So with this preliminary information from the state, what we're doing now within our budget committee meetings 
we're trying to quantify our expenditure pressures as we're planning for next year. So right now we've currently identified healthcare, which this is an expenditure pressure that we continue to have on the list each year because it changes. And right now our third party benefit consultant is finalizing projections for next school year. The addition of five additional counselors, which right now is the estimate of what would be needed to support our schools next year if the General Assembly approves this new revised ratio. And as recommended tonight, this is where we would like to get ahead of the game in providing um, this support to our schools sooner as we prepare for next school year, if approved by General Assembly. Then compensation for teachers and support staff and for context, for every 1% raise that the school division provides, it costs between 1.4 to $1.5 million for all employees. Um, based on some updated information as we're monitoring um, what's going on at the state level, um, there appears to be um, some strong indication that the 2% bonus may um, turn into a 2% compensation increase. Of course, this is um, dependent upon revenue and then final General Assembly action. And then the last expenditure pr pressure presented is the minimum wage increase to $11. And this is a part of the General Assembly's phase in approach to eventually bring minimum wage to $15 by 2026. So that will continue to be an expenditure pressure as we continue the phase in process that the General Assembly has approved. And this list is just a starting point. So we continue in our budget committee meetings to add to this list and quantify um, the pressures that impact next school year. So our next steps um, include continuing to analyze our pressures, but also looking at potential expenditure savings within our budget as well so that we can repurpose dollars. And then also making sure that we align our budget with the school board's priorities and our strategic plan. We also monitor the General Assembly's actions to see how that will impact our budget. We conduct our school board two by two meetings and conduct the school boards and city council buddy meetings. And we also have to make sure that we assess the impact of any changes in our local contribution, which represents about 30% of our overall budget. And before concluding the presentation, um, I do wanna make sure that I provide these key dates to our community. So on March 3rd, 2021, um, this is a date for the presentation of the proposed budget for all funds and public hearings are scheduled for March 10th and March 17th. And lastly, on March 24th, this is the scheduled date for the school board to vote on the fiscal year 2022 proposed budget. This concludes the presentation of the budget forecast for next school year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Dorch. Um, uh, at this point, I will ask if board members have any questions of Ms. Dorch. Yes, Ms. Cherry. Um, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had um, just a couple of clarifying questions, Ms. Deutsch. And as always, you always do an excellent job of helping those of us who are not as financially literate as others may be in understanding the um, information. But when you talked about the governor's budget, governor's proposed budget, that 2% bonus that could turn into a compensation piece or not for those SOQ positions, can you clarify what that means because sometimes people, they hear SOQ, but they think it's everybody. Could you clear that up? Yes, yeah, so anytime you hear the state is funding a 2% raise, what that means is that the 2% raise are only for the minimum number of staff that the state has determined under the standards of quality provisions. So within, 
probably every school division and definitely for ours because our young people's needs go beyond what the standards of quality are. We make sure that we have teachers over and above that minimum level of education that's required in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So when there's a 2% raise from the state, it really only includes a segment of the total population of employees within the school division. But here within Hampton City Schools, we have historically not separated between this teacher is a standards of quality teacher and this one is not. So when we're looking at raises, we look at the raise for all employees. Thank you. And I thought that was important to point out because I think that's one of the things that sets Hampton City Schools apart, especially when we talk about attracting and retaining quali quality staff, mm -hmm. because we don't separate, you know, if the state through SOQ says we can only, only gonna give money to 10 teachers and we've got 20, then we make up for the others because we look at each of them as value as the other. Yes. So I really want to point that out. The second thing is um, you mentioned something about the possibility uh, in the governor's budget of there being some lottery um, monies that will be distributed differently. Isn't there an issue that speaks to the gaming pieces now though that will be coming up shortly? And if so, could you just explain that? Yes, yeah, so in the initial presentation for the fiscal year 2021 update, it included the COVID-19 relief payments. And those payments are funded 100% from the revenue that's being incurred from the gaming machines that you know the community may see out at a convenience store, for example. Right now, those gaming machines are not um, going to continue into the next school year or the next fiscal year from the state standpoint. Therefore, the funding for the COVID-19 relief payments is scheduled to end come June 30th, 2021. Thank you. That's what I want. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Cherry. Uh, any other comments or questions from school board members? Comments from our student rep? Yes, Mr. Carnack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a comment about our uh, the school board priorities for the funding for the next year. I'm glad to see that reducing class sizes and competitive compensation for teachers and staff is top of mind. Uh, reducing class sizes takes on a whole different significance now uh, with the need to make sure that our students are safely distanced in classrooms. If, if you know, a return to in-person learning is seen through uh, and reducing class sizes has well-documented educational benefits anyway. Uh, and I'm glad that we are restoring that compensation increase for our teachers and staff, that general 2% uh, raise. Uh, it, was a, it was a disappointment that we were unable to do that last year just because of the unprecedented circumstances that came uh, when we first proposed that. So I'm glad to see that that's back in the budget. Thank you, Mr. Carney. All right, at this time, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Thank you, Ms. Dortch. Um, at this time, we'll move to our return to school update. Um, and I would ask at this time, um, Dr. Caggiano, um, and I know other members of the team will be joining him as well in presenting an update to the board relative to um, our return to school plan. Dr. Cajano. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Good evening, Chairman Kilgore, Vice Chair Woodhouse, members of the board, Dr. Smith. The purpose of tonight's presentation is to provide the board with an ongoing update regarding instruction and teaching and learning during the 2020-21 school year. Uh, joining me this evening for tonight's presentation, our Executive Director of Human Resources, Ms. Robin Ruth, our Director of Health Services, Ms. Glory Gill, and uh, Teresa Saro, a science teacher at Phoebus High School, as well as Jen Thomason, one of our digital learning specialists. The board is familiar with this slide. During the last presentation, we had the opportunity to share this particular slide. And uh, for the, the viewing audience at home, the community, we just wanted to remind folks that as we uh, continue uh, to look at uh, opportunities for decision-making and planning for return to in-person learning 
as well as those families who still want to work in a virtual setting. Uh, we continue to monitor the, the CDC indicators for dynamic school decision making and are using that framework as part of our decision making. So for those interested in learning more about that framework, simply click on that link in this presentation, which is available on board docs. And then as always, we have been for quite some time now updating each Wednesday morning on our website, that bottom link there, the HCS Health Metrics website. We've been updating uh, where we, uh, as far as the metrics we're monitoring, where we currently stand on a weekly basis. And of course, uh, general community could also find daily updates at the Virginia Department of Health School Metrics website which is also linked in this presentation. So CDC indicators for dynamic school decision-making as of this morning, uh, these are three of the metrics of course that we've been following closely uh, throughout the pandemic. And the first one there obviously in the highest risk category as well as the second one there. So we continue to monitor the new cases per 100,000 persons within the last 14 days for the city of Hampton, which again is currently in the highest risk category. We also continue to monitor that positivity rate during the last 14 days, which again is in the highest risk category. Uh, last board meeting, we had the opportunity to share with the board that we were looking to again survey uh, not only families, but staff as well. And we did that on January 6th. The, the verbiage for that survey is linked at the bottom of this particular slide. We have had some updates. As you recall, the last time we shared information, uh, the data that we've shared with the board in a couple of recent presentations uh, was from October 1st. And so again, we deployed that survey, the most recent one on January 6th. We closed it out yesterday morning. So this uh, data is hot off the presses and you'll see the reflection as of this morning. And so a slight change. Um, and the last time we were before you, 51% of our families uh, opting for in-person learning and uh, where we stand of, as of this morning, uh, rather fluid situation, 42% uh, opting for in-person learning. And as you can see there, we included a far uh, right column that says the, the differences uh, regarding um, one survey in reference to the second October to January, and certainly an increase in the desire to remain virtual for the time being. Also for the community, for those viewing uh, this evening who perhaps did not see one of the previous presentations or have not been to our website recently, this is another slide we've included in pre uh, previous, previous presentations. And we have a number of uh, not only protocols, but uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, that we have purchased uh, beginning last spring. And so if you wanted to uh, see a detailed listing of those, those were highlighted in, in a presentation in October and that link there will take you directly to that presentation. And then also uh, the first link here takes you to our return to school website. And we have a number of protocol and expectation documents that have been developed. And so those are available on our website. And of course, our YouTube playlist. So for example, what does it look like? What can parents expect for bus rider expectations when we uh, not only, uh, when we continue, to, to open doors uh, when it's permissible for in-person learning. What would that look like and what could parents and students expect? And so we've got uh, brief videos that we believe you'll find not only informational, but helpful. At this time, uh, Ms. Robin Ruth, our director, executive director of human resources will share some information in reference to operational capacity and also share uh, some survey results from our most recent uh, deployment of our staff survey. Ms. Ruth. Thank you, Dr. Caggiano, and good evening, uh, board members. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to share some information with you. Um, the data on this first chart is um, based on actual job accommodations and employees who have been approved for family medical leave or COVID leave and vacancies. Um, and since my last update, the, the data is divided out in terms of our total staffing, the percent that's working on site, uh, the, the percent that is approved to work 100% uh, remotely, which gives us our total percent of employees working. Um, it also takes a look at the percent of employees who are out on either family medical leave or COVID leave and the percentage of vacancies that we have. Um, so um, since my last update in November, uh, the numbers of employees working remotely has increased slightly. Um, however, the overall percentage of employees who are working in our school buildings, not departments, but within our school buildings has actually increased. And this is because a number of employees who had been on approved either FMLA or COVID leave 
back in the November timeframe have been approved to return to work. So they're no longer, when they were on leave, they were not working in any capacity whatsoever. So they have been approved to return to work, but perhaps not in the work building. For instance, if I was out because I had knee surgery, I may now be able to work, but I need to work from home because I don't have the mobility to get around the school building. Um, so that's why you'll see some fluctuations in those numbers, but the overall percentage of total employees working has increased within our school buildings. Um, there is a link at the bottom of this slide that will take you to the uh, operational capacity trend data if anyone is interested in, in looking at the numbers that were reported in both October and November. Um, you will notice that the um, overall um, employees working for transportation and food service has increased, or I mean has decreased, and that is due to an increase in the number of vacancies that we have uh, in both of those departments. Next slide, Dr. Caggiano. Thank you. All right. Um, also, Dr. Caggiano addressed the parent survey that was sent out on January 6th. We also deployed a, an employee or staff survey on January 6th. And um, we received 1,888 responses, which is approximately 60% of our employees. And we, we only asked three questions. The first question was around mitigation strategies that are already in place. We asked our staff members to review current protocols and provide input on additional measures that would, en would enhance student and staff safety. Um, for planning purposes, we also asked employees to indicate whether or not they plan to receive the COVID-19 vaccine when Hampton City Schools is able to offer it. And finally, we asked for any specific feedback that would further support the division's planning efforts. And with this next slide, I wanna share with you a brief overview of the survey results. Obviously, one slide is not going to, to cover all of the responses that we received from you know, over 1,800 employees, but you were able, or I was able to group them into some um, significant, um, data points that employees were interested in. Um, in terms of additional safety measures, many of the respondents indicated that the protocols themselves that we currently have in place are adequate. Uh, there were many folks who talked about the fact we've gone above and beyond in terms of the safety protocols that we have put in place, um, the equipment that we have provided. However, there, there was also an underlying concern that we ensure that the cleaning protocols are implemented effectively. Um, and there was some anecdotal evidence that information is being shared with Dr. Bowling so that he can, can address any concerns that uh, um, exist within individual school buildings. Um, one uh, request that we received from a number of teachers is that they receive some sort of partition plexiglass or plastic uh, for their desks that is similar to the partitions that students uh, have already been provided. So that is certainly something that we will take a look at. Um, regarding uh, employees intention to receive the vaccine, this we asked this question for planning purposes because we wanted to make sure you know, we have enough vaccine for the employees who are interested in receiving the vaccine, but we don't wanna to order too much and then, and then waste it. Uh, so approximately 49% of our employees have indicated they plan to receive the vaccine. We have about 36% of our employees who are undecided and about 15% of our employees who have indicated they do not plan to receive the vaccine. Um, the survey was not designed to, to capture you know, binding information. In fact, I've already received phone calls from folks who said, I can't get back in the survey, but I want to change my answer. I've talked to my doctor, and yes, I'm going to get the, the vaccine when it's available. So every employee will have the opportunity to schedule an appointment 
as we as we roll out um, the vaccination plan. And there'll be more information about that um, moving forward. Um, and finally, uh, much of the feedback regarding the division's planning efforts centered on the request to have at least two weeks notice before transitioning to the next stage in it, as students return um, during phase two. So, um, and then the, the other probably most significant area that we received comments is that uh, just a request that we continue to utilize regional health data. We have, in, as Dr. Caggiano shared at the beginning of the presentation, we've relied heavily on um, health data, uh, regional and state level, and, as well as the CDC. And they just ask that we continue to use that guidance and health data when we make the decisions that impact staff and student safety. Um, I will now turn the presentation over to our Director of Health Services, Nurse Glory Gill. Thank you, Ms. Ruth, and thank you, board members. Um, we are in the process of uh, vaccination planning, and this is an, a, probably the first time briefing for some, but update on this. Presently, we have 25 Hampton City School nurses and sub-nurses that have been trained utilizing the train modules that are through the Virginia Department of Health. That was one of the requirements that we have those training modules done um, before we could give vaccinations in some form of with the city. Uh, 32 of our Hampton City School nurses um, have been vaccinated through uh, either their what if they've worked for another hospital setting or we were able to get quite a few of ours done through Riverside uh, agreement that they vaccinated us. So that prepares us and ready for us to then um, be ready to give vaccinations. Next slide, please. Hampton Roads Convention Center has been our um, site uh, designated for us to be able to uh, give vaccinations. Um, we're actually in the process of finalizing everything, the setup, the securing of personnel and volunteers, and any sign-up procedures and, and training that's required. Um, it's quite impressive, and hopefully uh, I'm going there tomorrow to take some pictures and things so we can show you next time what that all looks like. Uh, our vaccination dates, we are proud to announce, um, are being established, and the first scheduled ones are going to be Friday, this Friday. January 22nd and Tuesday, January 26th. And so that's been a, a while coming, um, but we finally have gotten at least those two dates. This has been probably the hardest part for, for the group that has been working on this is to prioritizing who we can um, give vaccinations to. Um, unfortunately, we have a limited number of vaccines that we will get this particular first go round. And so we, it was difficult in deciding who needs to get this uh, originally. So what we've decided um, is our first priority group, which will get their vaccinations on the 22nd and the 26th and have received information or will be receiving information on how to schedule your appointment, which I, I've gotten some emails that they are already scheduling them. Uh, it will be pre-K through 12 special ed teachers who serve students in a self-contained environment. Uh, some of the things that we determined with this is that because those students um, uh, require quite a bit of uh, personal care and and other issues related to them, that was priority as well as their instructional assistants who serve those students. We also selected bus drivers and bus attendants who serve those uh, self-contained environments as well um, because they do to also interact and, and provide care. Also included will be my health clerks um, because of their role in not only um, in the clinic side, but they may be assisting us also in our vaccination clinic. Um, our occupational therapists and our physical therapists because they do care with those self-contained students. And then our long-term substitutes currently serving in the above assignments. And we've got quite a few that have been in that position and several that are uh, have an entire classroom with long-term subs. So, we wanted to make sure that they also were included in that. And then our second group, and this by no means reflects the, uh, the entire priority uh, for this, because we've got, we would love to at this point in time, if we, if, 
if it was our uh, plan alone, we would have everybody vaccinated as soon as we could get them vaccinated. But we only have a certain amount that comes to Hampton and the peninsula area, and we were allocated uh, particular slots. So this second priority a group will be these uh, employees. Uh, Pre-K and kindergarten students are pre-K and kindergarten instructors, our teachers, excuse me, and our instructional assistants for them. The remaining bus drivers um, are school building administrators and their staff in the main office uh, because of their direct op, uh, care and uh, dealing with the, the public. Grades one through three teachers are elementary K through five special ed inclusion teachers and our elementary pre-K through five resource teachers of the art, music, health PE, library and counselors. And then again, our long-term subs currently serving in the above assignments. Um, it, as I said, this is, is difficult, but we hope that uh, as our moving forward will happen very quickly that we can actually schedule some more dates very soon following. But our first two will be our, um, if you will, dry run on how to uh, make sure everything's ready and prepared for the, the larger scale both with our employees on the Hampton City side, as well as ours, as well as the whole community at large. Um, our nurses will be assisting in that. Next slide. Oh, that's not me, I'm sorry. Alrighty, um, and that concludes my part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Nurse Gill, as well as Ms. Ruth. This slide here represents uh, the last time we updated our return to school plan website was on January 11th. So this is just a, an update to the community here that that link at the bottom takes you directly to our return to school plan website. Of course, you can access it. There's a large icon right on the Hampton main page that you can access this information as well. Some of the big changes since we've last updated this since the 11th, uh, really in the area of secondary schools and particularly middle schools. Uh, we recently learned that we would be uh, receiving some additional CARES Act funding. And one of the benefits of that, it, it allows us to expand the model down to the middle schools that is currently in uh, the high schools and, and that it's planned for the high schools when we're in a position to open, open our, our doors. So just a quick recap right now, as Nurse Gill alluded to, we have in-person learning. Uh, so far we have pre-K students, kindergarten students, select students uh, who have uh, with disabilities being served in a self-contained setting. Right now, as, as the board is, is aware, based on the metrics in the region, uh, those students are currently all in a virtual environment. So currently we're in a 100% virtual learning environment. When we are in a position, uh, hopefully eventually to uh, go ahead and open our doors, uh, at the secondary level, we shared with the board previously, the model at the high school is what's called a current uh, a concurrent hybrid model. And so what that does with the technology we have in a high school classroom that enables virtual learners and in-person learners to engage in instruction uh, simultaneously or uh, concurrently. And uh, with the additional CARES funds, we've been now, as, as I mentioned, in a position to purchase additional technologies to move that down to the middle school level. And so uh, this update, if I as a parent were to click on frequently asked questions, here's the tab here. Uh, secondary frequently asked questions. And you see what I've highlighted here with the blue box. It says, I understand that on January 6, changes were announced regarding the, the learning schedule and model for middle school students during a phase two reentry. What will that look like? And so we've got a detailed response to parents there. If you're in our website and you click on that link right there, it takes you to this document here. And so if you've got access to this presentation, you see that, that document and that link in this particular slide. So the concurrent hybrid model with the use of additional funds, we would be able to expand that to the middle school. Prior to this, the model at middle school would have been, we were planning for, if I'm an in-person learner, I'm going to school on Mondays and Wednesdays and then interacting with my class on Fridays virtually. If I'm a virtual learner, I would have Tuesdays and Thursdays interacting with my class virtually on Fridays. And so what this will allow us to do at the middle school level, which this detailed FAQ gets into the, the nuts and bolts, is have a, a four day school uh, week for middle school students as well. And so they would also be going in this concurrent hybrid model where virtual learners at home engaging four days a week and then in-person learners uh, engaging four days a week, Monday through Thursday, Friday set aside for remediation and, and office hours. So, What's the, the, the big difference between middle school and high school? It is the same schedule. However, uh, the planning team and, and, and uh, teacher feedback was that 
for a middle school child, a middle school student, uh, 90 minutes, four blocks a day uh, can be a bit taxing on the computer in a virtual setting. And so uh, on January 6th, we've shared this uh, a detailed FAQ with our middle school teachers. Uh, Jen Thomason this evening will speak about some training that will be taking place on the 29th. Over the last two days, yesterday evening and this evening, our digital learning specialists have held uh, uh, Q&A sessions with middle school teachers as well, wanting to find out more about this model. And so the big difference is, uh, given our, our transportation and the logistics, when we are in a position to return uh, in-person learners, uh, the middle schools throughout our division will need to run on a traditional schedule. So in that case, as you see here, 90 minute blocks for each of our in-person learners. And so again, uh, looking at virtual learning and what some of the research speaks to in reference to uh, attentiveness and engagement, uh, what we're proposing again is here is that reduction to 60 minutes for middle school learners. And so the training on the 29th by curriculum leaders, teacher specialists will really emphasize how, how do I as a teacher working uh, with technology, uh, working with in-person learners, uh, how best do I design my instruction on a weekly basis to account for both sets of learners when one group of learners is 60 minutes and one is 90 minutes. And so we'll be working through that with uh, teachers on, on the 29th. But we're very excited that what we've shared with teachers during the Q&A is that uh, when we are in a position to open in person, they would have three options until they're comfortable with this particular technology you see in front of you. So the first, of course, is Zoom, which we're doing now. And so a teacher could be at the front of the room with his or her laptop and engaging in this current concurrent hybrid model with Zoom. We have web cameras all for our middle and high school teachers, and they can engage with a web camera. So not quite as tethered to the front of the room. And then uh, the device, which a lot of our teachers are excited about, and, and we've been trying out over the last month and a half, is the swivel robot. And so uh, the way the swivel robot works, and I'm going to go ahead and click on this one minute video here to give you an idea of, of how, this, how this robot works in our classrooms. So that is the swivel robot. As I mentioned, we have been uh, testing out the robot. And uh, last week, for example, uh, we had uh, Miss, uh, Miss Sorrow and uh, Jennifer Thomason, our digital learning specialist, Miss Sorrow, a, a science teacher at Phoebus High School in engaging virtual learners and in-person learners at the same time. And at this time, I'd like for uh, Miss Sorrow just to share a few of the, the benefits of swivel. And she'll be followed by Miss Thomason to talk a little bit more about the, the training for this particular piece of technology. Good evening, Chairperson Kilgore, Vice Chair Wedhouse, members of the board, the Hampton community, and a special thank you to Dr. Smith and Dr. Caggiano for this opportunity. Uh, what started out as a routine day for me, um, trying out some new technology just to see what would work and what wouldn't, um, actually turned out to be a game changer for my school year. Um, the benefits of the swivel were not even captured in the video that you just watched. It was probably the, one of the most significant social emotional learning tools that I have seen both for myself as a teacher and also for my students. 
Um, it increased the student attention. Um, it assisted the teachers with classroom management. One of the biggest concerns of teachers around the country and complaints of teachers around the country is in a concurrent model, at any point during the class, you are ignoring a very large part of your student base. So if you're attending to your in-person students, you are not attending to your online students. When you move to the computer to deal with your online students, you are leaving your, your students who are in person unattended. And that is just something that it, as a teacher's part, that is just something that we, we don't want to do. And this allows us to attend to both groups of students at the same time simultaneously. Um, the biggest thing for me was watching how it created a sense of normalcy for my students immediately. My chat box lit up, they, un they unmuted, the cameras came on, they wanted to see, I was, all I did, I was in an empty classroom, just walking around teaching like I normally did. And the comments from my students were, this is the first day I feel like I'm back at school. My seniors felt like they had a connection to their senior year. They felt connected to each other. Um, it really was a game changer for all of my students. They know um, when I come on, they ask, hey, where's the robot? If it's a day when I'm not using the robot, they want to know. He has a name. We call him Roger Dinkins um, in homage to the cinematographer because he is the world's greatest cameraman. Um, it really did facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning. And as um, watching um, members of DLT engage in the classroom and act like students while they were using the technology really let me know that my students were definitely on to something. Um, this allowed for me as a teacher, we are taught to teach from our feet to bring that energy to engage the students um, and sitting behind a screen really dampens that. And when I, as a teacher, was able to get up, walk around the room, write on the board, um, sit, you know, teach from different places in the room, I felt more like myself. Um, and I know that that transferred to my students and definitely seeing the peer-to-peer -peer learning. I have had the chance to have some in-person students who were in with me to remediate. And during that remediation, we had some virtual students and using that robot camera and letting them get a feel for what was going on in the classroom really helped them to engage in the material much more effectively than just virtually. So thank you for this opportunity and that concludes my portion. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. Ms. Thomason? Yes, good evening, Chairperson Kilgore, Vice Chair Woodhouse, members of the board, Dr. Smith, Dr. Caggiano, members of the division leadership team and the Hampton community. I would like to begin by saying that it is an honor to represent the innovation and professional learning team this evening to discuss technology support and instruction. The innovation and professional learning team has developed several opportunities for training at various levels from curriculum leaders to teachers on this new technology. We have provided an opportunity for curriculum leaders and teacher specialists to sign up for one-to-one -one in person training on the new swivel technology beginning tomorrow, where they can learn how to set up and use a swivel, as well as discuss how it may look within their content area. In addition, we have created a training module for teachers on the new technology that contains numerous resources such as tutorial videos and direction sheets. Likewise, we are planning to hold one-to-one -one in person and virtual training for teachers as well. We are working closely with the Swivel support team to include them in the trainings as well. In addition to the specific support and training on this new technology, our virtual help desk on Zoom, which is open five days a week, sees numerous teachers a day, and we also have parents and students join periodically as well. On the help desk, we offer technology support as well as implementation ideas and alternatives that may enhance engagement in a lesson. Our help desk will also be a place for virtual support with a new swivel and webcam technology. In addition, our, like Dr. Caggiano mentioned earlier, our team is supporting the professional development that is happening on the 29th um, to include things on this technology as well as best practices in virtual learning and creating engaging lessons. We have, off, we have also developed asynchronous training modules located in each school's Google Classroom as well as additional les lessons that can be found on our Cyber Learning Cafe. In addition, we have been working with various departments to plan and support the concurrent hybrid model. We have compiled information and resources on the HDS Digital Learning and Chromebook website for both teachers and parents. And we have developed out of the box lessons that we can bring into the classroom and deliver to students. We are continuously searching for new and engaging activities to share out with teachers to enhance lessons and inc increase student engagement and success. There are several links on this slide to a few of the items I have mentioned here tonight if you would like to take a closer look. Thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to share with you the wonderful things happening in Hampton City Schools to support our students' continued success. 
I'd certainly like to thank both Ms. Thomason and Ms. Sorrow for uh, taking time out of their schedules to join us this evening. Also, a big shout out to Venetia Farrell. Uh, Ms. Farrell was one who saw this in a, a visitation in another uh, district, virtual visitation uh, being implemented across the state on the other side and brought it to our attention. So shout out to Ms. Farrell, as well as, of course, John Eagle, Dr. James Maxlow, and everyone in the technology departments for uh, their plans in helping this uh, come to fruition. So. At this time, Chairman Kilgore, this concludes our presentation. Uh, any member of the team would be happy to uh, respond to any questions that board members might have at this time. Thank you, Dr. Caggiano. Uh, do I have any questions or comments from board members? Yes, Mr. Samuels. Uh, once again, thank you, uh, Chairman Kilgore, for the uh, opportunity to make a comment and also ask questions. And so my first question uh, our comment goes back to um, the family survey that Ms. Um, Robin Ruth uh, shared some information about. And so what I look at the, looking at the data from last October and this past survey that was done, it appears that there's a decrease in um, parents' desire for um, in-person learning. So. You know, when I looked at that, I, I, th there were two takeaways that I, I, I um, um, shared with myself, and then I also followed up with Dr. Caggiano and Dr. Smith. And so the first one is that parents um, may be satisfied with our virtual learning and or find our virtual learning product um, um, to be very good, especially with this new swivel um, technology that we're using. Secondly, um, parents may continue to be concerned about the in-person learning. So what I would like for um, um, Dr. Smith or Dr. Kajiana to just talk about our continued safety mitigation plan that we have in place as it relates to that. Sure, and I can um, jump in on it, uh, uh, Mr. Samuels. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, for example, um, I know Nurse Gill mentioned in terms of the vaccination uh, site and our efforts there in moving forward. Um, but I think also it's important for us to highlight um, as we talk about um, creating and maintaining um, healthy work and learning environments, that those mitigation strategies that we have in place are just as important uh, to continue with those mitigation uh, strategies that we have in place. And so the emphasis that we have placed on, uh, for example, the PPE, uh, those cleaning protocols and so forth, um, as a school division, that will remain as a priority for us. And so, again, um, we presented this, um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, during the October 7th board meeting, but we need to maintain uh, this um, focus in, in our school division. Um, and so um, while we are very excited uh, in terms of um, um, the vaccines and so forth and, and where we're headed there as a school division, but these protocols and measures that we have in terms of uh, mitigation strategies and so forth um, must remain in the forefront as a priority as well in the way we do business. So as a school division, I think in answering your question, we're not planning to move away from those mitigation strategies, um, even with the, the vaccination site and our efforts there. And I hope I answered your question, Mr. Samuels, in that, in that. Absolutely, absolutely. And then my second question, as it relates to the vaccination, and thank you, Dr. Um, Smith, for bringing that up, um, for the, the vaccination that is available to our staff. Um, so there, um, according to the data, there were approximately 36% of staff who are undecided, and then another 15% who indicated that they will not be taking the vaccination. And I know Ms. Uh, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Robin Ruth stated that uh, she has received several phone calls from parents, or not parents, staff who said they would like to change their um, um, response, uh, but unfortunately could not because the survey was closed. So my question for um, Ms. Robin Ruth is what, and Dr. Smith, you could also answer this, what process are and or protocol we have in place um, to ensure that staff who do not receive the vaccination when they do return to the classroom that staff and other students will be safe. That's the first 
question. The second question is also for those staff who do not receive the vaccination, uh, we will we'll continue to ensure that their job is protected. Maybe I'll take uh, the first and then yield and ask Ms. Ruth if she would pick up on uh, to, uh, as it relates to your second question. Um, and I'll go back to those mitigation strategies um, when we talk about um, creating and maintaining um, you know, safe and, and healthy uh, work and learning environments. Those mitigation strategies are very important um, that we maintain um, that as a priority in our school division. And so um, we see both um, the vaccination site and terms of the vaccines and so forth working hand in hand with our um, the protocols that we have and strategies, um, the mitigation strategies that we have in place. So um, our mitigation strategies would not go away um, at the appropriate time um, as recommended by CDC or others, uh, whether it's the health department, we'll certainly make modifications and adjustments um, based upon the science. But as of right now, we see both of them working hand in hand. I'll yield to Ms. Ruth to answer uh, your second question, uh, Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh Receiving the vaccination is not a prerequisite or a requirement for our employees. And, and there are many reasons that an employee may choose not to get a vaccine. I, it could be that I'm allergic to the components within the vaccine. So it, it would, for my health, be more risky for me to take the vaccine than for me to get COVID. Um, so we would look at every situation on a case-by-case -case basis, but it is not a requirement or a prerequisite for employment. And you know, we would not make any decisions based on somebody's refusal to take the vaccine. It, well, I mean, we may make some decisions. We would not make any decisions based on that would impact their employment. Okay. We may make decisions to provide them with additional PPE or things like that, but we would not make any decisions that would impact their continued employment with Hampton City Schools. And that is good to know, uh, Ms. Ruth. And so my follow-up question with that, so staff who declined the vaccination, um, mm -hmm. um, will they have to sign a particular waiver um, and, and the reason why I ask that if they have to sign a waiver so that they're not taking a vaccination, in the event, should that person become infected um, with the, um, um, the COVID-19, um, will that person then be eligible or continue to be protected under the COVID-19 protocols and so forth? Great question. To, probably a two-part answer. We have not... Um had any discussion about requiring folks who do not receive the vaccine to sign a waiver. In regards to whether or not someone who does, does not receive the vaccine and whether or not they would be eligible for COVID leave, again, the answer is it, 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 it depends. Um, if, if we receive medical documentation, and it is possible that even if I take the vaccination, I may still be placed on quarantine because of somebody in my household. Um, so we're gonna have to look at, at each case individually. Why, why are they being, you know, why are they being required to stay home? Honestly, if I have medical documentation or one of Hampton City Schools nurses sends them home, they would still be eligible for COVID leave from my perspective. Okay, well, thank you so much for um, answering my questions and um, um, great presentation, Dr. Kajiana. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Samuels. Yes, Dr. Mason. Dr. Mason, you're on mute. My apologies. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, along the same lines, um, with the folks that are that responded, I guess that they were not getting the the vaccine. Did they indicate whether or not they would be getting it somewhere else or um, through through another means, or were they just flat out choosing not to get it? Was that was that data captured by chance? Uh, there, 
Yes and no. There are some people who chose to provide additional information. It was there was no additional information that was required other than yes, no, or I have not decided. There are some employees who chose to provide additional documentation. Some indicated that they were um, going to work with their own medical provider. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. indicated that they had an allergic reaction and, mm -hmm. and were not able to take the shot. Um, mm -hmm. Some indicated that they had recently had surgery um, or, or another, mm -hmm. not necessarily allergy, but medical condition that mm -hmm. um, renders them unable to receive the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, those are the, the probably the two biggest buckets that the data fell into. Okay, because I know I, there's some um, just from other other organizations and other entities that I work with. I know that some people are just afraid they don't feel like they have enough information about the vaccine and so on and so forth or whatever. So are we doing anything to provide health education as well? Because I know one of the biggest concerns, you know, um, just dealing with another organization was kind of looking at, well, if you don't get it, you know, you don't get the vaccine, you run the risk of getting it and still spreading it to someone else, you know? So how, you know, what type of education are we providing others um, just in terms of just safety? We, we are providing, and I'm going to turn this over to Kelly. Oh, I think you're on mute, Ms. Goral. Yes, I can, um, I can answer that question, um, Dr. Mason. Um, every Tuesday since the beginning of November, we have been distributing our staff e-newsletter, our Be Safe, Be Well, Be Informed. Um, and we have been hitting very heavy on the education of the, different, the two different vaccines. Um, and working in partnership with uh, Ms. Lori Gill, providing staff members um, many um, different links and information that they can uh, keep reading upon as far as the vaccines are concerned. Okay, thank you. And just one last kudos, um, Dr. Smith, um, Dr. Caggiano and, and, and the academic side, great job with finding additional ways in terms of, you know, that social emotional piece, that, that swivel camera, things of that nature, you know, I told you, I put safety first because I know without a shot of a doubt that the, the numbers that are that were low in the beginning because we were not having face-to-face -face school, I, I told you, Dr. Smith, I'm confident that Hampton City Schools will find a way to bring those, you know, to bring us back in line. And this goes to show that you guys go above and beyond. So that Mary Peak Award, it's obvious why you deserve it. So, I mean, I, I'm, I just put Hampton City Schools up against any division. So thank you all for continuing to, to do what you do, to, to put us at the top and to keep our kids safe, to keep our staff safe, keep our faculty straight. So kudos, 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 and thank you so much. We appreciate that, Dr. Mason. And I will say, if I, if I just to follow up to your question uh, based on Ms. Ruth's response, um, excellent suggestion for us as a team also to go back. I know with the survey um, for individuals who indicated that they would not be receiving, um, we can, I think we're able to identify and we can send that out in terms of a follow-up question uh, to see whether or not individuals might be receiving it from um, their healthcare provider and so forth. So mm -hmm. excellent suggestion. We'll follow up on that particular question mm -hmm. um, because then we can get additional information while we may have some, but mm -hmm. more wide scale, we can, we'll follow up on that particular question for the individuals who responded that, um, in that way. E excellent mm -hmm. suggestion. Thank you very much, Dr. Mason. Uh, yes, Ms. Cherry. Yes, um, just as a follow up to what Dr. Mason was saying and what Ms. Ruth said, um, I agree with Dr. Smith, it would be really interesting to find out through a follow-up survey, the people who said no, and even the people who are uncertain, but especially the people who said no, they won't be taking the vaccine as to why. I do know that Ms. Gore and um, her group, they've done a great job in terms of the um, information um, about the vaccine and the two different ones and, and that kind of thing. But if, if we could follow up because if you're a person, and Ms. Ruth gave some great examples when you may be allergic, um, um, but if you're a person, for instance, who's not a needle person, you can give all the information you want to, uh, but if I'm not a needle person, I'm not taking the vaccine. And it has nothing to do with the vaccine. It has to do with the needles. So I think if we can find out, you know, um, just where our staff members stand in terms of, you know, 
why they don't or why they're considering not. I think that would speak volumes. Thank you. Excellent. We'll follow up in that area. Thank you, Ms. Jerry. Any other board members? Yes, Mr. Karnak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few questions and a, <clears throat> a deliberative comment following this report. Uh, so my first question concerns the uh, what we what we've been discussing the the breakdown in percentages of staff by intention to receive the vaccine. Uh, so, and uh, this question might be best for Nurse Gill, and I want to be careful about how I employ this terminology. But um, in a general vaccination context, uh, you know, let's say if we were talking about a normal year and we were uh, initiating a campaign to. Uh, deliver flu vaccines to students or to students and staff like we have in the past. Uh, herd immunity is very important uh, to an educational environment to make sure that, um, you know, if there is a flu outbreak, there are enough uh, students, parents, teachers vaccinated, vaccinated so that um, the flu may not uh, spread as quickly as it would otherwise. Uh, so what percentage of faculty and staff are we targeting to receive the vaccine um, in order to safely, uh, you know, in the, event, in the event that we do return to in-person school, what's that percentage at which um, that herd immunity is established? Uh, good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I would say, without the data in front of me or, or being able to have that for you, I would say at least our 50 percent uh, would would begin to start that that full process. And one of the things related to what you asked and and in our health mitigation strategies, it is sort of like a demonstration or a, a presentation that some of the doctors gave from CHKD where they talked about that uh, Swiss cheese effect. I look at uh, vaccination as that one additional layer um, for improving how the result end is, meaning less and less people are um, getting the, vac getting the uh, COVID because we're putting in so many layers. And so, Really, in addition, the vaccine allows even a more de a more thorough uh, screening or keeping from people getting the COVID. So the more that we have, obviously, the better chances are that we're decreasing, um, continuing to spread and actually slowly decreasing where we won't have COVID around. Or if it is, it's very minimal. And just like how the flu slowly weeds out, so will the COVID hopefully as we get vaccinated. But good question, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and then you said, uh, it right her, medically. you said it right medically. <laughs> thank you. I wanted to make sure I was using herd immunity correctly because there's been a lot of conversation about that. I wanted to get the facts straight. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my next question is for Dr. Caggiano. I want to ask specifically about the middle school schedule that was covered in the presentation. There, there was a there were 90 minute blocks for my, four 90 minute blocks on a typical day, uh, but 60 minutes. Uh, if I read the slide correctly and heard you correctly, only a maximum of 60 minutes at a time were devoted to instruction. What's going to happen for those other 30 minutes? Are those going to be uh, used for maybe social emotional learning focuses? What is going to fill that extra time in those blocks? Yeah, a good question, Mr. Karnak. I didn't want to get into the weeds too much on that one, but uh, what, what we're doing is, for example, there are certain days as a middle school teacher, for example, where the first 60 minutes of my 90 minute block, uh, I'll, I, I may decide to have all students engaged at the same time for some direct instructions, let's say the beginning of the unit. So not only my in-person learners, but my virtual learners. After 60 minutes or right around that time, give or take a few perhaps on this particular day, um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, you know wave by and, 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 and let the virtual learners know I'll see them tomorrow. Uh, I could have planned, and that's why we've given teachers an all day uh, planning day and in, in addition to some remediation on Friday. I could have planned for uh, an independent assignment for some virtual learners. I may, and what we're doing is we're not necessarily stopping instruction at that point. So it could be that I've got a couple of virtual learners who may log back on just for a few minutes at the end of the block. It could be that I'm working small group instruction with the in-person learners. And so that could be one day. Another day could be I've got uh, the virtual learners where I'm doing some small group with in-person learners. I'm asking the virtual learners to 
to perhaps read something, work on something, a flipped classroom approach where they're viewing a video in advance of meeting, and they're actually going to log on 30 minutes late to the class today. And so what we've shared with teachers thus far in writing and in some training is that uh, it's a bit of um, an opportunity to show your creative side. You know, often I've planned for a, a group of 90, uh, 90, a group of students for 90 minutes, and now I've got some flexibility here to really break into some small groups. So, uh, number one, this model significantly increases instructional time for middle school learners, which we know is key based on the fact they've got four different teachers. Our elementary teachers, there's a little more flexibility. There's a different model there. So, a little bit of a, a lengthy answer to your question, but no, we're not stopping instruction. We will embed some time in for social emotional learning, uh, but just because virtual learners may not be on, online at the same time, as a teacher, I'm planning for that, uh, how I'll uh, address both groups of students uh, on a weekly basis. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. It was, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're able to clarify. Thanks for that. Uh, and then there, there was just that discrepancy there and I wasn't sure what was going on with that, but um, thanks. And then just a final comment, the, I think it must be, it must continue to be uh, this board and this division strategy to emphasize caution, patience, and prudence regarding dealing with COVID-19, the, you know, the numbers may change right now. We're on the unfortunate side of those numbers, but um, safety must remain the number one priority. And I, we should absolutely continue to prioritize that. Uh, that is paramount. Thank you, Mr. Karnick. Um, any other comments, board members? Yes, Ms. Cherry. Sorry, I just have one last one, um, Mr. Chair. And it's really is for Nurse Gill. Um, I remember Nurse Gill, I remember hearing a, a presentation not long ago by Dr. Fauci. And he was talking about, I guess that herd immunity piece, he was talking about if he could get 70% of the United States vaccinated. Now, I mean, that's for the, that's the entire United States, not our area, that he thought we'd be you know, in good stead. And they did address the, the person who was actually interviewing him, talked about the fact that all those reasons like Mr. Samuels was discussing about why people don't take it. So the interviewer talked about the polio vaccine, which years and years ago, which I remember, um, was on a sugar cube. So they had almost 100% people taking it. And, and I don't know if that was because people had that adverse reaction to needles or being stuck or whatever. But in that same interview, they talked about the possibility of a nasal spray being developed. Have you heard anything about that? I haven't heard anything about nasal as of right now. I know that there are other uh, vaccines coming out, even to include possibly one that's a single dose. Uh, mm -hmm. You only have to have that one. So I know that there are several in the works. And ultimately, um, I believe you'll see one also for students, because right now it's 16 years and older can have the vaccine, nobody younger than that. But that we know that it, it is impacting our students in some cases more so uh, with this new uh, strain coming, uh, starting to sh show its head. And so, you know, they've got quite a few in the works. I haven't heard of them all. Uh, I, I've, I've just worried about the ones that are currently in, in mm -hmm. practice, but I know that for sure there will be other, sh other shots, um, but for you, those that don't like uh, needles, uh, um, it may take a little while, but I, I don't know. I honestly don't. I could look and I can find out for you. I just wondered if I'm had that been discussed among the, you know, your healthcare field or anything, because I did hear that. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, ultimately, yes, you're you right. Dr. Fauci did mention the 70%, um, but uh, in general, if we can get at least 50% of our staff to do that, I think you're gonna see an improvement even in, in, in our circle of, of uh, the contact tracing and things we're already doing, I think we'll see an improvement. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Cherry. And again, thank you, Dr. Caggiano, Ms. Ruth, Nurse Gill, um, but a special thank you to uh, Ms. Thomason for just identifying the technology and then standing up the support that, that helps to roll it out to the staff. And a special thank you to Ms. Saro. Uh, it is always great to hear an, a heartfelt endorsement from a classroom teacher about a new technology. So. Uh, kudos to, again to Ms. Farrell for uh, seeing that and, and bringing it uh, to the attention of the division so we can consider using it. So 
Again, thank you. Excellent presentation and update. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And at this time, uh, we'll ask Ms. Dorch uh, to provide uh, the board with an update in terms of uh, the financial report. So almost uh, the Ms. Dorch CFO um, uh, section tonight. So Ms. Dorch, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you if you'll come back and uh, provide the board with the financial report, please. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, so for our monthly operating report for November, 2020, our revenues total $66 million and were 1.4% higher um, when you compare to the previous fiscal year with much of this increased state funding directly related to basic aid. Our cumulative expenditures and encumbrances totaled $92 million and were approximately 1% lower when compared to the previous fiscal year. And as indicated in your November 2020 board report, um, the analysis was done on the budget based on that December forecast. And as promised, the communication was presented tonight as part of the fiscal year 2021 budget update. And lastly, the report also includes a list of transfers to and from the technology classification. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dortch. Any uh, questions from board members about our uh, business operations financial report? All right, again, thank you, Ms. Dortch, for all your presentations this evening. We're not quite done with you yet, but we'll, we will be soon. Um, we now move on to uh, section five of our meeting, which is the hearing of any delegations or presentations of any written communications or petitions. My understanding is uh, that we have not received any Ms. Bowers. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, we will now move on to deliberation, which includes uh, one item 6.01, the fiscal year 20 ta ta 2021 budget update recommendations. Um, I guess, uh, so we've heard the presentation. So I will now open it up uh, to board members um, for any deliberative comments or questions of Dr. Smith, Ms. Dorch, or of each other. Are there any comments? Yes. I, I, it's not a comment, um, um, Chairman Kilgore, it's a question. So do we need to move this item to action since um, it needs to be approved by February the 1st? I believe that is the recommendation of the administration. Is that not correct, Dr. Smith? Correct. Okay, so yes, we will need uh, after deliberation, if there are no deliberation comments, uh, I will entertain a motion to move it to action for sure. Um, Chairman Kilgore, if there's no deliberation um, items or comments, I'll, I'll make a motion that we move it to, uh, um, to action. Okay. Um, who made that? Who was I my second? I have a motion for Mr. Samuels and a second for Ms. Jackson Afonja to move. Uh, the recommendations for the revised 2020-2021 uh, budget uh, to action. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote. Dr. Mason? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Afonja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Ms. Cherry? Aye. <laughs> Mr. Kilgore? Aye, motion carries. That now becomes our one and only action item 7.01. Uh, I will entertain a motion to approve uh, the division's recommendation to uh, update to the FY 2020-2021 budget. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve 7.01. The FY 2020 2021 budget update recommendations. Second. I have a motion from Dr. Mason and a second from Dr. Woodhouse. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Cherry. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say that when Ms. Tina Banks Gray and I had our two on two with Dr. Smith and Ms. Deutsch. One of the things we talked about is the importance of a community knowing that a CEO actually cares about his people. 
And we feel that with what Dr. Smith and Ms. Deutsch and his Dr. Smith's team has come up with in terms of these budget recommendation speaks to that piece that tells all of our employees that they are valued. Mm -hmm. And we think this is a positive direction in attracting and retaining staff. And we're just very pleased to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Cherry. Any other comments? All right, hearing none, Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote? Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Safanja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Ms. Cherry? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? I have a statement to read. As a member of the school board of the city of Hampton, Virginia, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the FY 2020-2021 school operating budget because my wife is an employee of Hampton City Schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the vote on the budget fairly, objectively, and in the public's interest. My vote is aye. And the motion carries and passes. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to informational items, um, and I hope board members had a chance to look at the dual enrollment update. A uh, big thank you uh, to Dr. Smith and uh, his team for putting together uh, that presentation. It was very comprehensive and uh, really impressive uh, data with regards to our dual enrollment program. Um, our next item is 8.02, our next meetings. Our next meeting will be a regular meeting held on February 3rd. Um, I truly doubt that it's going to be at Jones Magnet Middle School, but we will, that is uh, currently on the schedule. I will let board members know uh, that is likely going to be another Zoom meeting being uh, so close to this date. And then uh, following that, we will have a work session uh, held February 17th. And if available, we will hold that at Rupert Sargent Building, 1 Franklin Street. Both of those are subject to change due to the COVID-19 restrictions. Okay, uh, then we have informational items. And I will start with uh, you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the school board. Just a quick observation, as you indicated, uh, in the information section, um, we have the dual enrollment uh, report. I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Uh, Raymond Haynes, um, our executive director of secondary school leadership and members of his team for their outstanding work. Um, when we talk about equity and uh, access and opportunities and outcomes for young people, um, you get a chance, we get a chance to see this certainly in the dual enrollment report. Um, and so we would just encourage um, uh, the community uh, when they get an opportunity uh, to review the dual enrollment report as well. I know that Dr. Haynes would like for me, um, uh, without prompting, I know that Dr. Haynes would really like for me to highlight on page three of the executive summary that uh, over the past five years, our students uh, have earned um, a cumulative total of 14,348 dual enrollment credits. Uh, this reflects a 753% increase in dual enrollment credits earned and a combined total savings of over $2.2 million for our families uh, to date. And that's pretty significant when we think of uh, uh, our school board and uh, staff and the hard work and certainly our young people and the families that we serve. But in this report, just to really highlight that if you look um, even at um, the year of, um, of, of COVID, the pandemic, the 29-2020 school year, uh, the credits earned by our young people increased even during the pandemic. And so th that to me just, it speaks volumes about the commitment of our young people and our families and how exceptional our young people are here in Hampton and the hard work in this partnership with Thomas Nelson Community College. And so, um, and using the words of Dr. Mason, kudos to uh, Dr. Haynes and, uh, and members of his team and, and our teachers uh, and all of the members 
uh, who are involved in this great work on behalf of our young people. So thank you so very much for allowing me just to highlight that. But it's a comprehensive report, and I know that you've had an opportunity to review it as members of the board, but I wanted to highlight that for the community at, at, at large. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, informational item from board members. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Chairman Kilgore, uh, I just also want to uh, uh, piggyback on what Dr. Smith says because I'm going to speak personally on behalf of uh, in regards to the dual enrollment as it regards as it retained to the Samuels household that my daughter um, will be graduating Hampton High School with 28 dual enrollment credit hours from Thomas Nelson Community College. She's halfway through her freshman year in college. So it, 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 it makes sense. And, and, and our students are taking advantage of these opportunities and, and so forth. So um, Dr. Smith, um, thank you for your, your vision when you came to Hampton City School and your partnership with Thomas Nelson Community College. It is, it is paying dividends um, now and will continue to pay dividends in the future. So I just wanted to share that from a personal perspective. Thank you, Mr. Samuels. Any other comments? Um, and uh, Mr. Karnak, any comments from our student rep? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd first like to note that it is the, we are now in the concluding stretch of the first semester. So students, uh, you know, continue to get your work done, prepare, for, study for those end of semester midterm exams. Uh, and, you know, we'll always be there to support you and know that we are here to help. Uh, and that uh, teachers and faculty and staff truly understand the extraordinary circumstances of the moment and are making every effort to help you in every way related to academics, uh, certainly. And uh, an additional spotlight, uh, continuing a trend from the previous meetings, uh, I'd like to once again congratulate more of our students who have been accepted to various colleges and universities such as Old Dominion University, Norfolk State University, James Madison University, and Howard University, uh, whereas, uh, which is now where, uh, you know, a head of state went. And uh, so that shows that the students of Hampton City Schools are continuing to have their success rewarded both in Virginia and across the nation, truly. And so again, congratulations to those seniors uh, and congratulations to, the, congratulations to those seniors who have submitted applications, but are waiting to hear back. And uh, I'm sure that you will again be rewarded when that time for that decision comes because the students of Hampton City Schools, as we just covered, you know, specifically in the dual enrollment report, uh, but, you know, across the board as well, they put in the work and they, they do whatever it takes to succeed. Uh, certainly, and their hard work pays off. So again, congratulations. Uh, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Karnak. And I, I guess I wanted to add to what Dr. Smith said. Um, in that presentation, it also talked about our uh, uh, advanced college experience academy or, and uh, to see that we're getting ready to graduate our first cohort and that the size of that academy is growing is uh, is really a testament to how powerful that can be. Um, kudos to Phoebus High School for hosting that academy, and then also to our International Baccalaureate program at Hampton High School, and the amazing opportunity, although very challenging, uh, to the students that uh, take on the IV program. Uh, just great, great programs all around, um, and uh, amazing performance from our students. Uh, before I adjourn the meeting tonight, I just wanted to uh, let the public know uh, that the board was in a closed session before this meeting. Uh, we paused to come to have our public meeting, but we will be going back into closed session uh, following the adjournment of this meeting. I'll let board members know that uh, I'm going to try to get back into that Zoom meeting with about, within about 10 minutes. Um, so I would, as soon as we all get back in there, we will start and finish up that, uh, that business matter. So anyway, without further ado, uh, this meeting is adjourned and thank you all and have a great evening. Be safe. <laughs>